Hi, welcome to the concept of intracranial regulation. This is Tracy Hansen. I'm going to be covering the anatomy and physiology of intracranial regulation. If you take a look in your book, chapters 43, 44, and 46, in your um, Iggy and Workman, as well as your adult ATI and PEDS ATI, and you will find that additional information in your detailed uh, student syllabus. To get us going, we need to be thinking about um, intracranial regulation. You need to think about what is inside of the skull. So basically your skull has three essential components. You have your brain tissue, your cerebral spinal fluid, and then intravascular blood. And as you can see on the slide, there's percentages listed up there. They're just not something that you need to know. But something that you do need to be aware of is that if one of these components increases, say you have um, increased cerebral spinal fluid, then the intravascular blood or the brain tissue is going to be compromised and has to decrease. So under normal um, conditions, the balance of these components kind of runs like a circle and or you could think about your skull as an egg and you know once you crack that then contents are going to spill out and that's when we're going to be uh, running into trouble. So factors that influence intracranial pressure um, or the arterial and venous pressure, intra-abdominal and intrathoracic pressures. So things like coughing, blowing your nose, sneezing, tight restrictive clothing. Um, if you're, the head of bed is lowered below 30 degrees, uh, posture, temperature. So all those things can um, influence intracranial pressure as well as um, blood gases and specifically carbon dioxide. Um, so be thinking about adequate oxygenation. Um, the electrolyte that we need to be looking at are going to is going to be sodium. Um, so when you think about sodium, just think what sodium does. If we have, you know, if you increase that, you're going to have increased swelling, increased edema, and then things that we're going to be looking for in our patients with increased intracranial pressure are going to be things such as level of conscious changes. Um, decreasing level of consciousness. So that's going to be your initial, very first assessment that you're going to want to be doing when you're looking at those uh, patients. So now let's take a look at objectives uh, that are going to be covered during this segment or this concept. It's going to be on page 15 of your detailed student syllabus. So be looking at that, um, the anatomy and physiology on your own. That's what we're going to be doing um, in the voiceover. So be looking at that and then just make sure that you are familiar with the objectives uh, prior to coming to class. Terms that you are responsible to know, full consciousness, confusion, disorientation, um, obtundation, stupor, semi-comatose, coma, and deep coma. When you're doing your reading throughout the chapters, make sure that you jot down the definition of these terms and you can uh, recall what they mean and are able to discuss them. A nice little key that is good to know as far as a level of consciousness goes, this is called AVPU, so they're alert. That means you can walk in the room and I'm fully alert, I'm conscious, I can answer questions. V is going to be verbal stimuli, so with verbal stimuli, you may have to walk in the room and say, Tracy, it's time to wake up, or kind of say their name and kind of get them going. They might be a little slow to respond, but not terrible. P, painful stimuli, that means you're going to be doing something painful. So when you do things like sternal rubs, um, pinching of the nail beds, or um, shaking their arms, anything that's going to cause pain to get them to wake up so they are responding to pain. And then you is of course unresponsive and that's where we do not want to see our patients headed. So be um, aware of those of that nice little term and understand what that is. This is a pediatric Glasgow coma scale, and with the Glasgow coma scale for adults or pediatrics, it is a three-part assessment, and so with that assessment, you're going to be looking at their eyes, so you need to know their perla, pupils equal, round, reactive to light, and accommodate. Verbal response, so how is it that you're waking them up, just like the AVPU that we just discussed, and motor response, how are they able to move, are they able to move, um, so do be taking a look at that. 
with your pupils. This is um, just variation in pupils, variation in what eyes might be. When you look at um, A right here, probably somebody that's having a stroke, you might see um, maybe some weakness on one side or the other. Also, what you might be looking for is um, if they have leg, um, meaning that one eye is more sluggish than the other. Obviously these pupils in D are going to be very dilated and then in E kind of worst case scenario is that you have one pupil that's reactive and then the other pupil is what we call blown um, which means that um, that pupil is extremely dilated. F with the pinpoint pupils you may see um, people on um, illicit drugs um, have pinpoint pupils so be, um, just kind of be aware of that when you are doing your assessment. So with normal intracranial regulation, um, obviously our neurologic system regulates all uh, body functions. So our neurologic system collects sensory input and information from external and internal um, environments. It processes that information and then after that processing occurs, then that's when our body decides what we should do. So the nervous, uh, the nervous system is responsible for uh, cognitive control, uh, both voluntary and involuntary activities. So any threat to any aspect of neurological functioning is going to be a threat to that entire person. When you're looking at cerebral perfusion, I don't know if you recall from anatomy and physiology, but um, the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries are joined together by a small communication of arteries, and they form that circle or ring at the base of the brain. It's known as the circle of Willis. Um, and so you can see off to the right side of your screen talks about uh, the circle of Willis. So with perfusion, we need to ensure that we have adequate perfusion. Um, when someone has a s increased intracranial pressure, that's obviously going to decrease uh, cerebral perfusion, and that's why we're going to see those level of conscious changes. So with normal presentation, it's just kind of a brief overview that, you know, um, there's two principal parts, the central and peripheral nervous systems. So what makes up the central nervous system? Your brain and spinal cord. And what makes up the peripheral nervous system then? Cranial and spinal nerves. So they're going to work together to receive an impulse, interpret it, and initiate a response. When they are working together, it enables the individual to maintain a high level of adaptation and homeostasis. Uh, the nervous system is responsible for the cognitive functionings, as I've said earlier. Um, also, you need to think about neurons and how neurons function. And the basic cell, uh, they are the basic cells of the nervous system, and they have that myelin sheath which covers them. And when you think about a myelin sheath, remember from A and P that that is responsible for nerve impulses, you know, moving very quickly. So when you think about that, think about snap, 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 snap. They're moving. It's a nice fluid movement. Some of the diseases that might create deficits in that myelin sheath, um, Guillain-Barre syndrome and musculosclerosis are just a couple um, to think about. Your brain is going to be protected by the meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and then also the skull. Cerebral spinal fluid also provides nourishment, but its major responsibility is protect and prevent injury. The skull is going to be your outer covering, so think about that egg, outer shell. And the meninges are just that nice covering that surrounds the brain to protect it. So what is your brain made up of? The frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. So when you are preparing for this course, be, uh, you know, have a good understanding of what these lobes are for. Um, so the frontal lobe is responsible for speech, emotions, intellectual activities, and voluntary skeletal movement. The parietal lobe is responsible for conscious awareness of sensation. Also the somatosensory stimulation. So with that, that means temperature, pain, shapes. So if you put something in your hand and your eyes are closed, so you put a paper clip in there, 
you're going to be able to tell that it's a paper clip or you'll be able to tell that it's round or square. Occipital lobe is responsible for vision and it receives stimulation from the retina and also interprets that visual stimulation in relation to past experiences. And then the temporal lobe is responsible for interpreting auditory and olfactory stimuli. A great um, website to go to, www.learningnurse.com backslash games backslash guess backslash brain terms backslash game dot html and you'll find really um, nice reviews and uh, a really good study guide for you to help you prepare. Uh, the diencephalon that is going to house the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And as you can see on this slide, it talks about what they're responsible for. All input is channeled to the cerebral cortex and then is processed by the thalamus. The hypothalamus is the autonomic control center. So what does that mean? It controls many body functions, so it's going to be responsible for blood pressure, heart rate, force of contraction of the heart, digestion, mobility, motility, respiratory rate, steps, um, those types of things. And then uh, your epithalamus helps control moods also helps with sleep cycles and it contains that choroid plexus as you can see up on your slide and the choroid plexus is where cerebral spinal fluid is formed. The cerebellum um, and brain stem, the cerebellum sits below the cerebrum. It's the, responsible for coordinating stimuli It also helps um, with equilibrium and muscle tone. It helps provide precise timing for muscle coordination. Helps with smooth muscle movements. And then your brain stem is located uh, between the cerebrum and spinal cord. And the brain stem connects the pathways between the higher and lower structures. So it connects you know, your brain with your spinal cord. And the thing that you need to think about your brain stem is something is going, you have increased intracranial pressure and something's going to herniate. It's going to be your brain stem because that's easiest to come out of the base of your skull. It can expand at the base of your skull. And then that's when our patients are really going to run into lots of trouble. Um, it's also an autonomic control center, so hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, sneezing, um, those kinds of things are also controlled by the brain stem. And then your spinal cord, that's kind of your communication center. It it's a continuation of the mandula oblongata. It passes through the skull, and then it's protected again by meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, and then um, our vertebrae, of course. So the spinal cord has the ability to transmit impulses to and from the vein uh, via your, you know, your spinal nerves. So when you think about your spinal nerves, there's 12 pair and those are going to be responsible for communicating sensation and that's important when you're thinking about somebody that's maybe had an epidural or a spinal anesthetic. When you touch them, obviously where you are touching them and what they're able to feel communicates with what nerve that um, anesthetic has been introduced into. And then our last slide here, um, reflexes. Um, when we're ta thinking about reflexes, obviously they're fast, unpredictable, it's involuntary, so you have your knee jerk um, reflex. You also have your finger, it gets burned, ouch, that hurts reflex, um, those kinds of things. So be thinking about the synapsis, where the impulse is transmitted, and the efferent motor nerve fibers that cause the fibers to contract, creating um, the movement. So we'll stop here and I will continue on with reflexes and a couple of other things on the next presentation and then hopefully you are ready to go um, when we meet in class and discuss intracranial regulation.